But today, uh, I'm excited because we are going to uh, talk about community, yeah. healthy community, and, uh, and I'm excited, and like I've mentioned like five times already, oh, actually, I have it in my notes. I want to highlight Nathan Canto in San Francisco. It was his birthday yesterday Yay. in San Francisco, which is Happy awesome. Happy birthday, Canto. Yep. And lastly is here in the room, we saw an announcement of our Orange County location getting a new building, which is cool. And so, OC, we're excited for you, and that's going to be good. But listen, let's get into it. We're going to look at Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, and, um, and this is known as the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus. Growing up, it was Zacchaeus. Sakil. All right, you ready? Yep. Take it from your silence that you are. All right. I also am ready. He entered Jericho, Jesus, and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. Everyone say Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. Through the link, say Zacchaeus. You guys are like, oh, that's, that's, that's not us. <laughs> he was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house. So he hurried. He hurried, and he came down, and he received him joyfully. Now, I want to pay attention to verse 7. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Yeah. God, I pray that you would speak to us today. I pray that as we uh, just lean in and just open your word, God, speak to us. I pray for anybody in here who finds themselves in a lonely season, needing community, needing friendships. God, I pray that you would set us on the right path today. But God, I pray for those in here who we have that friendships. We have those friendships. We have those people. Would we be people to create a space for others? Yes in our life as well. So challenge us where it's needed. Comfort us where it's needed. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 One of the things that I have been uh, very fascinated about uh, pastoring is the more I have conversations with people, the more everyone's problems are very much, they are unique. And when you take a two steps back, you realize how similar they all are. Yeah. We all seem to struggle with very similar things. And one of the things that, that I've kind of come to realize that we all struggle with are friendships, yeah. relationships. We either struggle with the relationships we have to either keep the peace with them because they can be annoying, um, or we are thriving and we can have a bad season, but be okay because we've got good people with us. Yeah. And one of the things that I, again, have been shocked about, though, is in cities, especially like L.A. and San Francisco, is how many times it comes up in conversation, yeah. uh, this phrase, I don't have any friends. I feel like I don't have any friends. Or people that I see have a lot of friendships say things, I feel very lonely. Yeah. People that come into church life and go, I feel like I haven't found my people. Or I feel like we just don't click. And the more I go into conversation, I just go, well, what about this person? I saw that you posted that you were hanging out with this person. And they go, oh, no, I have people that I hang out with, and I just don't have any friends. 
And it's really interesting that we can be in a culture, we can be in an environment where we have people to spend our time with, but not people that know us deeply. Uh, I think that is one of the scariest things is that we have people that we can have fun with, but we don't have people we can connect with. Yeah. That's a scary thing because what happens is that at the end of the day, if you have no one that knows you for you, you'll find yourself feeling very lonely. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very uh, tough place to be. It's the paradox of being humans, that we all long to be seen for who we are, yeah. to be known for who we are, and to be loved for that. Like, I want you to know me, see me, and still love me. And at the same time, what we're most afraid of is for someone to see us, yeah. for someone to truly know us, yeah. because then leads the question, would you actually really love me if you saw me and you knew me for me? Yeah. And so today we want to talk about community. Yep. I think it's something that we have seen that is so needed. And I think in this season of church life, it's what we need to move forward. Yeah. I think one of the things that we see is that for God, community is so important. Genesis 1 and 2, it talks about creation, that God made the first day and the second day and the fifth day and the sixth day. And he said, it is good. But the first time God says something isn't good, which we need to pay attention to, yeah. is when he says it's not good for man to be alone. And we take that and we go, that's why people should get married. But actually, it's, a, it's actually talking about companionship. Yeah. Yeah. That it's not good right. for people to go about their life on your own. If you think you can get through life being a lone ranger, you're going to find yourself at a dead end sooner or later. If you think you can carry the world on your back, you're going to find yourself burnt out and exhausted. You need people. Yeah. I would even go as far as saying you need the people in your room here, in your room there in SF, in Orange County. God has designed all of us to be this really weird interwoven ecosystem yeah. where you need the people in here. Yeah. And they need you. And so let's look at this passage. Yep. Courtney, why don't you break down this passage for us and then what we can learn from it. Perfect. I think one of the things we need to remember when we look at scripture is that whatever is repeated is really important. So like Sam mentioned in Genesis 1, we hear God say, it is good, it is good, it is good, over and over again, so that when he says it's not good, your ears perk up. What's, what's repeated is really important. And so in the life of Jesus, we see him repeat a bunch of things. Um, one of them that comes to mind is that he withdrew. It says oftentimes he withdrew to lonely places to pray over and over and over. It's repeated. So that means there's some implication for that on our life. Or I think about um, the fact that he was, and I don't particularly like this one, but the fact that he was interrupted all the time. He's on his way to do something and he's you don't interrupted. Like being interrupted. I don't. You don't like when I. Do you like being interrupted? All the time. It's like my favorite. <laughs> I know you don't. It's like my favorite thing. I know, I'm working on it. But, um, but we see it all the time, and it has implication for our life. But the last one, probably my favorite that comes to mind is that we see Jesus eating all the time. We see him having meals with people. We see him at weddings. Um, why was it so important to include this in scripture? Throughout the gospel, there are 19 meals recorded. And to me, it makes sense that we record the miracles and the sermons and the conversations with the disciples. But why, why did God have the writers of scripture include these meals? Why was it important? What implication does that have for us? Or even I think about, if we're going to go further, why this meal with Zacchaeus? Um, maybe you know, thank you, we have some limited real estate. Um, maybe you know the story of Zacchaeus. Give me a, a hand wave if you're on the link in your room, that's fine too. If you grew up in Sunday school, if you knew Zacchaeus, heard of him, anybody? Anybody know the song? I won't make you sing it. We did sing it in OC in the 9 a.m. sing it. What is it? <laughs> Go for it. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. I appreciate the clap. A sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed on, come on, he looked up in the tree. And he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today. I have... Sam has never heard that song I've in his life. I've never heard of that. I grew up in Spanish church. We, I didn't, I, no. 
Sing also, a Spanish version. Also, um, what's with that melody? I didn't write it. That's how it goes. Twinkle, Thank you. twinkle, little star. <laughs> it's not the same. Old McDonald hat. <laughs> I feel like there was no melody. They're just like, you know, like sing talking. Like, it doesn't even rhyme. And then he went yeah. there and then he came back and he said, calm down. I'm going to your house and then we're going to hey. have some steak tonight. Mm -hmm. But it's like it makes no sense. But it means sense. that all these years later, all of us remember it and know the story. So shout out to the writer. Also, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. To go a wee little man. I, I don't know if that's appropriate anymore. Um, yeah, it is a little bit sad. Or not sad, but it feels like a lot. Later today, I'm gonna go okay, home okay. and I'm gonna... <laughs> We're gonna keep going. This is, <laughs> we're spending way too much time on this. But maybe on the surface, it looks like it's a story about Jesus going to eat with a short person, because it's outlined. But it's actually so much deeper than that. I love that Sam highlighted when he read it, that the crowd grumbled when he met with Zacchaeus. Why? What, was it because they cut his sermon short? No, there's actually something really um, so much deeper going on there. Um, Zacchaeus is what we know he is what we know as a tax collector, and in our modern context, we don't have that. Um, but let's put it into our modern context so that we actually understand the implications of this story. Um, I know you came to church to hear more about California taxes. Um, you're like, I actually came to church to get away from that. But um, in this modern context. Let's say you are working a job, you come in, you've made a certain amount of money, you come in, at that day and age, Rome's tax was 50%. So right away, 50% of your income's gone. Now tax, so that's the state, right? Tax collectors were um, people in individual towns that were able to impose a tax based on how they felt that day, what they felt about you, if they liked you or not, and so that could be an additional 20 to 30% on top of your income. So that's 70 to 80% if we're all doing simple math. So you can imagine the um, grumbling in the room when Jesus is teaching and he looks up at somebody that this community would have known, somebody that would have exploited them, somebody that would have taken um, income from them that they would have used to feed their families, to build their lives, hard-earned income. And he picks out him and he says, I'm going to go to your house today. And the Bible says they grumbled. It would be really important for us in reading this story to ask ourselves, who, what people group, what, you know, certain belief system that if Jesus picks somebody out of a crowd would offend us. If Jesus said, I'm meeting with that person, you're like, that guy, that person who has wronged me, that person who's taken from me, that person I so disagree with, who would that, who would that be? There's something so much deeper happening here. And, and it's actually more than lunch. It's more than um, sharing a meal together. Jesus is modeling something for us. So what about this has to do with building community. Um, one of my favorite speakers says this, that Jesus walked people into the kingdom of God one meal at a time. He's actually teaching something to us about how to build community. And so what does it have to do with us? Yeah, let's look at this practically, shall we? Yeah. So I think if anybody in here and you're going, dude, I need help with this. I don't know what this looks like. How do I create a really great community? I think we all want to be a part of something really great. And especially now when there is all kinds of communities, there's fitness communities, there's gym communities, there's brand communities, there's like skincare community. It's like everything is a community now. Yeah. And it's going, but what is it to be a community of faith? Yeah. What does it mean for the church to be a community? And it comes down to two things. And we're going to, I want to tell you what they are. And then I want to show you how Jesus modeled it in this story. So here's a point if you want one. In order to build healthy community, we are both a guest and a host. We've got to learn this dynamic that in every situation, every interaction, every party you go to, every church service you're a part of, if we want to create and be part of a great community, we got to learn how to switch between being a guest yeah. and a host. Yeah. A guest is someone who rocks up to be a part of something. If I invite you over to my house, you don't have to do anything. I want you to show up. I want you to sit there and enjoy it. I want you to sit there and just know that I've thought about everything. I've prepared this for you. I want to make sure I kind of read th this right, is that the the responsibility of the night isn't on you. You can relax. You can just show up and I will make sure you have a good time. Yeah. 
For you to be a part of a community, you got to learn how to be a guest. Yeah. But also, we got to learn how to be a host. What is a host? The host is constantly making sure that everything's okay. We're the ones putting the event together. We're making, we're kind of always on. And even if you're not in a space where it's your thing, it's funny because hosts always like give themselves away because they're always making sure everyone else is good. You know, you're like, are you liking it? Like, especially like if you've ever invited a friend to church, you just automatically become a host. You're like, yeah. What do they think about this? God, that's a really weird joke. I wish they didn't make that one. You know, you're just so, you're so mindful of the environment yeah. because you want them to have a good time. So it's not about you actually like hosting an event. It's more your posture, right? Yeah. You're looking after somebody. What, are, are they okay? Do they like this? Do they feel comfortable? Is it too pushy? Is it too churchy? Is it too weird? Is it, uh, uh, what, 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 what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? And you're, you're kind of on edge. But the thing is, is in order to be a part of a community and to create community, Community, we got to learn how to switch between both. In this story, what do they say? It says that they grumbled when then they said, this Jesus has gone to be a guest yeah. of this man. So Jesus, he didn't have to prepare dinner. He didn't have to rock up to the spot and, and, and make sure that the house was clean. Zacchaeus is the host. Jesus is rocking up to be the guest. Okay. But then how many of you know that it quickly changed and then Jesus becomes the host, and he says, today, salvation has come to this house. So is Jesus just the guest the whole time? No, he's a guest when he walks into the door. But then in that interaction, even though it's not his home, he didn't prep the meal, he could still lead Zacchaeus to where he needed to go. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons, I think one of the biggest reasons why we across California, all of our locations, if you're listening to my voice, I think one of the reasons why we struggle with finding community or building it or being a part of it is because we're either really good at being a guest or we're really good at being a host. Like it's either one or the other for some people. Some of us struggle with just being a guest. Yeah. Like, hey, it's not your job to look after everybody else. You've just got to sit down and just enjoy it. But some of us are too good at being guests that you just rock up whenever something, someone's putting something on. You're like, any party, I'll be there. <laughs> but open up my house? Yeah. Mine? Mm, I'd rather not. And so we're too good at being guests and we struggle to be hosts or we're too good at being hosts and we struggle to be guests. Okay. And so if you are a host, like you go, hey, I feel like I'm the, always the one putting it on for everybody else, especially if you've been in church for a long time. Like the, I think this is one of the, the pitfalls that we find ourselves in is that, especially like for me as a pastor, we can put it on for everybody else and then we forget to be a part of it ourselves. Right. And so I want to speak to you if you are a host, and then I'm going to speak to those who feel like they're more of a guest. Is this okay? Yeah. Yep. So if you're a host, if we're only hosts, we become Martha. Yeah. The classic story of Mary and Martha. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10 that Jesus was coming with his disciples into the village and that Martha opened up her home to invite Jesus. That is amazing. Oh my gosh, if I could host Jesus in my home, that would be pretty remarkable. But what happened was she didn't know how to switch from the host and then switch to be a guest and sit and receive from Jesus. Yeah. Instead, she was a host the entire time that the Bible says that she was so preoccupied with everything else, she missed that she had Jesus at her house. And so if you lean as a host, let me tell you something. Don't get too preoccupied with setting the table that you forget to sit and eat with your guests. If you're a host all the time, you're the one setting it up. Everybody's over at your house. You're the house everyone wants to hang out with. And you want to make sure everything's good. Don't get so preoccupied with setting everything up that you miss the party. You threw the party. You didn't even get to enjoy the party. That's the worst thing ever. And it reminds me of my grandmother. I, I, my grandmother is the most wonderful, beautiful Mexican woman, I think, on the face of the earth. Hopefully my mother doesn't see that. 
But, but my grandmother is the sweetest person. She doesn't speak a lick of English, nothing. She can't write her name. She doesn't know how to write. She doesn't know how to read. But she is the most servant-hearted woman I have ever met. Oh, my gosh, she's wonderful. The thing is, though, and something that happens in Latin culture, especially with our elders, is they will cook everything for everybody. And I can tell you, I've probably only eaten my entire life, I've eaten two meals with my grandmother. Because every other time, she will not sit down. She will not eat until everybody else has eaten. Do you want something else? Do you want more? I've got a little bit more. I've got dessert. Do you want something else to drink? And then you finish the meal. We got pastries. We got pan dulce. Do Do you want coffee? Do you want hot chocolate? What do you want? I'll make it. If not, I'll make it from scratch. And she'll host everybody. And sadly, when everybody's gone, when everybody's left, she will sit there and she will eat by herself. And oftentimes, if you're a host, that's exactly what we do. We will set up for everyone else and then we go, I feel like I'm taking care of everybody and no one takes care of me. I feel like I'm looking after everybody and no one's there to look after me. But at the same time, we kind of do it to ourselves because we want to make sure everyone's good and then we eat by ourselves. And then we go, we feel so lonely. It's because we got to learn how to shift between a host and a guest. Here's the last thing about hosts. If we're only the host, we start to assume burdens and responsibilities that aren't ours, but God's. This is when we say things, if I don't do it, no one will. If you don't invite them, no one will. If you're not their friend, no one will be. If you don't bring them to church, no one's going to bring them to church. And so what happens is you start to feel the responsibility that you have to then create it for someone and force them to be part of something. And can I tell you, that's not your job. People are grown. They can make their own choices. All we can do is set the table, but you can't make anybody eat. You can't make anybody sit down. But we can create the space. It's the same thing on a Sunday. My job is to make sure that we create an incredible environment with our staff and our team. But I can't force you to eat. I can't force you to engage in worship. That's not my job. But it is my job to make sure that we create an environment where you feel safe, where you can engage. But you have to choose to do that. Lastly, for our guests. I was going to say, any guests in here, but I don't want to call you out like that. So (laughs) lastly, for our guests, if we're only guests, we become Simon the Pharisee. Simon the Pharisee invited Jesus. So what, what role should he have played? If he's inviting Jesus, what role should he have played? A host. That's not what happens. Instead... Set, the Bible says that there's a woman who comes in and breaks perfume at Jesus' feet. And internally, Simon says, if this guy was a prophet, he would know this woman is a sinner. And Jesus rebukes Simon, not for having him over at his house, but because he didn't fulfill the duties of a host. He says, I came in here. You didn't offer me anything to clean up. You didn't give me anything to any of the customs of what we do in hosting people. But this woman has done everything you should have done. And we become a guest, a host, sorry, a guest only. And I'll read you this last one and then we'll move on. If you only show up to receive... You could be robbing others and yourself yes. of what God might want to do through you. Come on, Sam. If all you do is rock up, I'm just going to show up, receive. Man, there's some people in here. You've, what people need, like God has placed that in you. Like what people need to hear, God has placed gifting inside you, perspective inside you. You're robbing yourself from the opportunity of being used, but we're also robbing others of being blessed when all we do is act like a guest. Wow, did that rhyme? Oh my gosh. So if if we go, man, I'm just rocking up. And again, I'm not saying you have to, you just show up to events. 
I'm saying, what is your posture in different rooms? Yeah. Can I ask you for, for church? What is your posture on a Sunday? Are you a host ready to look after people? Or are you rocking up going, I wonder what kind of songs we're singing today? I wonder what the message is going to be today. I like it. I didn't like it. Or maybe we can learn to be both. We can be a guest. You can sit and receive. Absolutely. But also, I've got a responsibility to look after others as well. Why don't you take us from your court? Yes. Sorry, I'm just working out. Um, one of the things that in the story that I love is that Jesus doesn't just pull doesn't just pull Zacchaeus aside and have a conversation. He actually does have a meal, so that is something that we need to look at. And so, one of the things that I think are really important to um, remember as we're building community is that a well-rounded understanding of healthy community it includes hospitality. And you're going to hear me talk about this for years on end, probably. I believe it's something that God's highlighting to us and to our team and to our church. That if we're going to build true community outside of this gathering on a Sunday, it's going to come from that. Like Sam's saying, this openness of not just having a house and having people over for dinner, but that openness of life, that openness of I'm setting a table wherever I'm going. Um, Recently, Sam and I heard this stat that has been um, a bit haunting, if I'm honest with you. So I'm going to read it, but I'm not meaning it to depress you. I'm meaning it as that it's an opportunity. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. I read a stat that during COVID and after COVID, we see that 26% of boomers have stopped attending church, 35% of Gen X have stopped attending church, and 50% of millennials have stopped attending church. That's a crazy number, 50%. 50% people that this was a part of their life, this is a part of who they are. And I think if we're going to reach people or build true community, this is part of like Sam, we aren't just a community because they're people in the same room or a community united around what Jesus, who Jesus is, who we're becoming, how we serve and create the kingdom of God on earth, bring the kingdom of God to earth. But if we're actually going to reach those people, it likely, maybe it will happen in this room, but it will likely happen in your house, at your dinner table, when you take your kids to, you know, school drop off or whatever, when you go to your morning coffee run, the people that you're interacting with, how do we become hosts in that setting? How do we set a table? How do we make it so inviting that our community is is thriving? People actually want to be part of that. What could that look like? And so I guess I want to challenge us a little bit is when we talk about community, I hope that it isn't just something that my church that I see on Sunday, they're my community and us four and no more, you know? No, it's actually, it's, it's held in tension, like Sam said. It's this, and then it's also people who don't know Jesus. What I love about the life of Jesus is that often when he wanted to correct the church or believers, he would stand up in a setting like this and preach a message. But so many more times when he wanted to get to know, uh, as people would say, sinners and tax collectors, he'd have a meal with them. We don't see him correct them publicly often. We see him sit down, get to know somebody, and have a conversation with them. And like we said, walk people into the kingdom of God one meal at a time. So what might that look like for you? How would it look to live as a host in your everyday life? Yeah, I love that. One of the things that we were saying with our staff is that we, you know, we're not a FUBU church. You know, FUBU, for us, by us. Like, I think the moment we become a church that where we build something for us and by us, and it's just about these four walls, man, we've lost it. But how are we still, I think from the very beginning of of Hillsong LA, Hillsong Orange County, NSF, it was never about how do we get more church people in church? It's how do we get people that don't know Jesus and engage with them in dinner tables? It's one of the things that we see in Luke chapter 24 is when Jesus is resurrected, one of the places he reveals himself isn't they, they were walking for seven miles talking about the Bible. That's not when he reveals himself. He reveals himself at a dinner table when they broke bread and they thanked God. And it says that their eyes were open and their hearts were right. burning and they realized Jesus was sitting right in front of me. How many tables does Jesus want to reveal himself at? How many di- dinner tables does he want to show people that he's been present, that he's been there? And you know who Jesus would be in that table? You. Yeah. You could be that that personified Jesus in that moment. Right. Why don't you take us to that third point, Court? A healthy community 
is well-versed in the practice of welcome home. We, um, we've had this language in our church for as long as I've been a part of it and longer than that, and it's welcome home. And I believe it is profound, um, and it's who we are. It's a spirit of what we want people to experience when they walk through our doors. But sometimes that's the goal, right? That's the vision. That's the sentiment. But sometimes the practical outworking of Welcome Home is this tangible acts every single day of just normal interaction with people, of like we said, setting the table in front of people. If we look at that word hospitality, I know I mentioned it. All it means, it's in the original, it means philoxenos, and it's love of the guest, it's love of the stranger, it's love of the people that we happen to encounter along the way. What might that look like? What might, the look, what might it look like to have that practice of welcome home? Um, I know. Ooh, ooh. They're like, it's over. Be you have to end. Be our guest. Be our guest. So much singing. Oh, my goodness. All right. If you're watching, uh, guys, other locations. Can you see us? We're just setting the vibe here for you. There we go. Um, no, we will, we will lift these lights in just a moment. But, yeah. yeah. But I think one of the reasons we wanted to talk about this and even want to take some time to pray is because it is a, a topic that comes up often. It is a thing that we hear people say. Um, I don't have community. I think cities like LA are and SF, I would say it is difficult yeah. and it's intentional. And I would hope that my prayer is that at the church, as the church, that we could model that, that we could model what that looks like. Um, I agree. There are three different types of relationships that socially happen all the time uh, that can be brought down into three different categories. There are civic relationships. There are traditional relationships like family. And then there's romantic relationships. And every life, for the most part, has one of those three in their life. You have a civic, which would be your job if you work, even if you are self-employed uh, or you are a freelancer in any kind of space. You've got your clients that you have to have that interaction with, and you have a civic relationship with them. You've got your family, whether it's your mother, your father, your brother, your cousin, whatever that relationship is with any type of family members, whether it is by blood or whether it's just by relationship, we have those family relationships. And then the romantic ones, obviously, if you are married, if you are in a dating season, uh, whatever that is, we have those. Uh, one of the things that is said in studies is that those three can't be neglected. We will always prioritize one of those. Like, if you go without texting your boss back, you're not going to have a job much longer. Yeah. Um, you have to upkeep that civil relationship. Uh, if you're going to have your family, even if you don't have a good relationship with your family, there are people that take the place of family. If those that have father figures, whether it's by blood or by just relationship, again, we upkeep those because of the investment they are into our life. And so you don't go without not talking to them. And then the last one is going, man, if you don't text your spouse back for a couple of days, you probably won't stay married much longer. And, and you give that a try and see how it goes. So... Either what I'm trying to say is, is that those three are ones that you need in your life. Friendship is not in those three categories. Yeah. Friendship is the first thing to go when your life gets busy. Yeah. It's the first thing you will compromise. It's the first thing you will reschedule. It's the first thing you leave on the back burner because you actually don't need it to get through life. You can go through life with your spouse, with your boss, and with your family, and you'll be okay. And then we go, these people are my family. These people are my friends, until you actually need a good friend. Yeah. And so the reason why I bring that up is to go, man, the way we're gonna cultivate friendship, true friendship, is by learning how to be hosts, how to be guests, yeah. and allowing ourselves to be known and to know others. And so I don't know why the lights are still so dim, but um, if the team could come up, but I just, we just want to pray for people today. And again, we just wanted to make today very practical, very simple, that it, honestly, I feel like those two categories seem to embody so many of us. If you are naturally um, a guest, uh, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I feel like I'm more of a guest than a host. Um, I'm like, I'll rock up anywhere. Like, I'll be, I'm good, you know? Or I don't really need anything. I'll just be my own host and my own guest, and I'm happy by myself. Um, as where Courtney is such a host, um, she will set up, I remember, for, um, like, uh, the Stranger Things 
you know, season thing. She threw this massive party. It wasn't, it wasn't like a massive uh, an attendance. It was like, <laughs> it was like plates. It was like decorations. It was everything. And it was Courtney and I, Luke and Mary Crowley. That was it. That, she went through all this work for two people. Like it is in her DNA. I'm not like that. I am like, yeah, you know where the, you know where the plates are. Um, I don't have water, but we can drink from the sink, right? Um, like it's just complete opposite. But again, it's time and time again where people go, man, but if I come in, if I came into this environment, if I came into my friendships and I was just there to take, I'm not gonna have friends much longer. And if all I do is just give and I don't take the amount, the time that I need to have friendships that input into me, well, man, you're going to burn out very quickly. And so why don't you stand to your feet and at all of our locations. And so we just want to pray for two groups of people. The first is if you are like, you, you're just like, man, I, I need good friends. Maybe you just moved into the cities that you're in. If you're in San Francisco, if you're in Orange County, if you're in LA, if you're like, man, I just moved here. It's my first time here. I just got here even two months ago. I feel like, especially in LA, like if you've been here under 12 months, you're still new here. I think if you've been here under two years, I would say you're still new here. You're still kind of like, if you haven't gotten at least five tickets in the first 12 months, like you're still new here. If you haven't been towed yet, you're still new here. Like it's not, you know, there's like all these different things we could say. But if you go, man, I, I actually really need friendships. Maybe you used to have them in the previous season and you don't anymore. I just want to pray for you. But then I, we also want to pray for a group of people and you're going, man, I, I actually feel that stirring of like, I've got good friendships. But maybe it's time to be a good friend to somebody else. Yeah. And it might be people in this room. It might be people in your world, people in the workplace, people wherever it is that you find yourself. But now, hey, it's, I've been a guest. Now it's my time to be a host and learn how to balance that. I believe that God finds it so fulfilling or makes it so fulfilling either way that those who are refreshed will find themselves refreshed. Yeah. Those who refresh others will be themselves refreshed. So we want to pray for you. With every head bowed, please, just for privacy. And you go and everybody in here and you're like, man, I'll, again, across all of our locations, you're like, man, that's me. I, I, I need friends in this time. It's been a tough moment. Would you just raise your hand all across all our locations? Like, I need friendships. I need people in my life. Courtney, why don't you pray for us? God, I just thank you for every person um, with their hand raised, somebody, anyone who's been courageous enough to say that, God, I just thank you that you promised to set the lonely in families, that that's not a nice concept, that friendship isn't our concept, Lord, but it's yours. And so I just pray for every person that um, is maybe missing those relationships at the moment. God, would you bring the right people in? Would you, um, would it be something that they wouldn't have to strive for or search for, God, but would you just bring the right people to them? Would there be an ease about it, Lord? Would they um, be seen and known? and loved for who they are, God? Would they have relationships that would um, draw them to you and reveal more about you, Lord God? And I just thank you that you're bringing them in even now, or maybe highlighting people in their life, and there's just a new connection and a new season, Lord. And so I just thank you for, um, for community, and I pray that each person here would experience um, the fulfillment of having people that know them, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. And God, we pray for anybody in here and they feel that shift across the link, across all our locations. God, here in this room as well, anybody in here, good God, use me. Use me to set the table. Use me to be a, to be a bridge. Use me to, to be who you've called me to be, to make a space for people to feel the love I've received from you, Jesus. And God, we pray that we would be a community of people, a host of people to welcome the cities that we are in, that people that don't know you, would we be in the discomfort for those of us who have maybe gotten too comfortable 
Would you make us uncomfortable? Bring some mess into our lives of people that bring that with them. God, would you help us to create a space to, to set the table for people to encounter you? In Jesus' name, amen.